It's the most effective innovation learning network we've got in Northeastern Ohio. Just first-rate uh, work. Great leadership. Felix Bruick, I think, is the outgoing chair. Um, Felix is, uh, was, was with McKinsey for many years. And Chris Mapes from Lincoln Electric is the incoming chair. So it's effective, it's vital, it's needed. So congratulations, Ethan, to you and your team on all the success you're having. And for those of you uh, who can utilize the services of Magnet, I'd really, really encourage you to get fully engaged. You know, manufacturing is important to us at PNC, and I think you would expect me to say that to this crowd, right? Um, it's our history, it's our foundation, it's 20% of our loan portfolio, which is the biggest concentration that we have. It kind of mirrors the size of manufacturing in the local economy. We have 40,000 business clients in Northeastern Ohio. Um, and those are companies with revenues kind of a million dollars all the way up to Eaton and Parker Hannafin and Swagelock. Thousands of manufacturing firms that we bank. And you help us every day better understand what your needs are from the conversation that we have and from the questions that you ask us. You know, and ultimately and uh, lately, those questions have been a lot about information, right? So the, the number one question we get is, when are rates going up? <laughs> I don't know. No one does. <laughs> One person, Janet Yellen, probably does. How high? I don't know. Um, and maybe Gus will have some further uh, explanation on that. You know, what are you seeing in the economy out there is another question we get. But um, there's a new question that you're asking us. And specifically, the question you're asking us, is my information safe at PNC? More and more, that's the question we're hearing you ask us. So let me take a swing at that one. And I'm going to use the uh, common Cleveland verb. PNC's all in in protecting our information for your benefit. When you think about it, a lot of our information is your information. So we're all over it. You know, we spend about $800 million a year on capital expenditures. Uh, and over the next few years, a higher percentage of that is going to be put into cybersecurity. In fact, over the next probably two and a half to three years, at least a billion dollars we're going to spend to protect your information. I'd encourage you to go to www.pnc.com, our website. On the top third of the front page, you're going to find a, a, a click on cybersecurity, and it's entitled Prevent, Detect, and Respond. And it's an article about our fusion center, which is, uh, if you print it out, you'll see the description. It's a five-page description of a 60-person, 24-7, 365 bunker, the sole purpose of which is to prevent cyber attacks, if we can, detect them as early as we can, and then respond to them and remediate them as quickly and as efficiently as we can. I don't normally use these uh, opportunities to do a sales pitch, but I can't help myself today. Uh, this topic of cybersecurity, I think, is too important to all of us. If you're a client at PNC, Please know that we're, we think we're at the front of the line in working to protect your information. And honestly, if you're not a client of PNC, I'd suggest having a discussion with your current banking partner about what they're doing to protect your information. After that conversation, just know that we're ready to talk. Enough of the commercial. Let me do what I'm supposed to do, which is introduce Gus, our next speaker. And it's a pleasure to do so. I haven't seen Gus yet today. I'm right here. There you are. <laughs> It's always good to make sure the person you're introducing is in the house. So Gus is one of our senior economists at PNC with a really wide portfolio. Importantly, one of the things Gus is responsible for is the Economic Outlook Survey of Small Business Owners, which is a really important data point for us to understand how we need to respond to the market. Been with us for about four years. Before that was with Moody's, where he's responsible for running the computer model of the U.S. economy. Uh, Treasury Department before that, University of Illinois as a professor before that. Really broad experience he's bringing uh, to share with us today. 
He's been on every news show you can imagine, most of the business shows you can imagine, including my favorite, Kai Rizdahl, NPR Marketplace. I listen on the ride home every night. Um, went to Cornell for his undergraduate and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. So without further ado, let me introduce Gus Fouché. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here again with, with Magnet, and I've always enjoyed coming here uh, to speak. It's always a pleasant drive, and I appreciate the invitation to once again talk with you. And I'm going to talk with you about what's going on with the uh, there we go uh, with the uh, economic outlook for the United States, uh, the outlook nationally for manufacturing, and what that means for the Northeast Ohio area. Uh, right now, we have an economy that is growing roughly two or two and a half percent. Uh, we did have a weak first quarter when uh, GDP growth was, was just barely positive, uh, but a lot of that was due to the bad weather. We, did, you know, we saw bad weather in many parts of the country, it delayed construction projects, it caused production difficulties, and so we've seen economic growth pick up since then. Uh, the second quarter was very strong. The economy grew about 4% uh, or so at an annual rate in the second quarter. Some of that was inventories. We added a lot to inventories in the second quarter. So inventories were a drag on growth in the third quarter of this year. Uh, but the good news is, is that we've worked off a lot of those inventories, so growth should pick back up again in the fourth quarter. Uh, demand for U.S. produced goods and services was very strong in the third quarter, and I think that that's a testament to consumer spending uh, and business investment, and I think that consumer spending is going to continue to drive economic growth throughout 2016. Uh, we do see a labor market that is continuing to improve. Uh, you know, we saw GDP, output of goods and services, that turned around in, in the middle of 2009, uh, but we didn't see jobs start to pick up until 2010. The U.S. lost about 9 million jobs during the Great Recession, about 7% of total employment, uh, biggest job losses proportionally uh, since we've seen since the Great Depression. But we have been steadily adding, adding jobs for more than five years now. Uh, we've added about 13 million jobs. Uh, and we reached a new employment peak in the middle of 2014. So every month as we get more jobs, uh, we do see a new employment peak, and we are steadily uh, reducing the amount of slack that is in the labor market. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've added about 200,000 jobs per month on average. We think that to keep up with normal growth in the labor force, we need about 100,000 jobs per month. So we've been running at about double that pace for two or three years now, which means that we're reducing the slack in the labor market that has persisted since the Great Recession. We've seen the unemployment rate fall from a peak of about 10%. It's now down to 5%. I don't think the job market is quite as good as an unemployment rate of 5% would normally suggest. I do think there is some more slack out there in terms of people who are working part-time who would like to be working full-time. Uh, people who are high school grad or college graduates who have a uh, job that might normally be held by high school graduates. We, we are making significant progress in reducing labor market slack. And I think at the current pace that we're going, uh, we should be at close to full employment by the middle of 2016. Uh, we did have a couple of softer job reports in, in August and September, but then in October the economy added 271,000 jobs. That's a very big number. Uh, and so that gave us some confidence that the weakness that we saw in, in August and September was just temporary, and it isn't indicative of broader problems in the, in the, in the economy. Um, if we look at manufacturing production, this is, industri this is a measure of industrial production in manufacturing. This comes from the Federal Reserve. Uh, you can see that I set the peak before the recession equal to 100. Uh, basically, manufacturing output dropped 20% during the Great Recession, and that was only a, over a period of about a year and a year and a half. So a huge contraction in the industrial sector in the United States uh, due to the global recession that we saw. Uh, since then, we've had a gradual recovery, uh, but as you can see that we're still not back to where we were prior to the recession. We're down by a, a couple of percent uh, from where we were prior to the recession. So it has been a slow recovery for manufacturing, uh, but we are getting there. Um, you know, we've had uh, gains in business investment on capital equipment. We've had uh, a strong uh, consumer spending, uh, particularly for automobiles, which is a impor very important industry for northeastern Ohio. Uh, we had auto sales of 18.2 million units at an annual rate in, in um, 
in September and October. Uh, this is going to be the best year for the automobile industry since 2000 in terms of sales. Uh, and the key thing here is that the industry is doing it without resorting to all those incentives that they've used in the past to spur sales. So there's pretty strong demand for automobiles, and I think that's going to remain the case. And that's going to be an important driver of manufacturing growth in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I think that we still have a lot of what we call pent-up demand for autos out there, people who put off purchases in 2008, 2009, 2010 because of the recession. They're looking, going to be looking to replace those older vehicles that they've been holding on to. And so I think that we'll see uh, uh, solid growth or solid uh, continued production and sales in automobiles, and that's going to be very important for, for northeastern Ohio in particular. Um, but we have seen manufacturing grow slow uh, over the past six months or year or so. Uh, this is the Institute of Supply Management uh, Purchasing Manager Survey. Uh, they do a non-manufacturing survey, that's the orange line. They also do a manufacturing survey. Uh, what they do is they go out and interview purchasing managers. Uh, what are your sales like? What's your production like? What are your inventories like? What's your employment situation? And then they put together an overall index. Value of 50 indicates the conditions are neutral for, for uh, industry. And so what we've seen is, is that manufacturing from about a year ago slowed from very strong growth to now it's basically roughly flat. So what we're seeing is manufacturing overall that is generally not expanding but not contracting either. I think we may see a little bit of a contraction over the next few months, uh, but we have seen a dip, significant slowing in manufacturing growth uh, over the past year or so. On the other hand, what we have seen is non-manufacturing industries have helped pick up the slack. So this is construction, this is uh, business services, this is retail, this is wholesale. Uh, those types of industries are actually doing uh, better now. And in fact, we're, we're close to a decade-long high in terms of non-manufacturing output. So we have seen a shift in the drivers of growth for the U.S. economy from manufacturing to more consumer spending and, in particular, construction-led growth. Uh, and I think that that's going to remain the case throughout most of 2016. Uh, let me talk about a couple of the drags that we are currently seeing on manufacturing. Uh, one of them is the strong dollar. Uh, so if you look, the I put the U.S. dollar, that's the orange line on the right-hand scale. Notice that I flipped the axis so I have 20% at the bottom. So over the past year or so, we've seen the U.S. dollar strengthen by about 15% against global currencies in general. Uh, how many of you have seen a negative impact from a stronger dollar on your sales over the past year? Okay. I see a few hands out there. Um, you know, the, the stronger dollar makes goods produced in the United States more expensive overseas. It makes goods that are imported into the United States less expensive. And so as the dollar has strengthened, we've seen exports decline, uh, at the same time, consumers are spending more. We've seen imports increase. And so trade is going to be, it has been a negative for growth in the second half of 2015. And trade will be a negative for growth in 2016. Uh, I do think that the dollar is going to strengthen somewhat more against other currencies in 2016. Uh, and that's a result of what the Federal Reserve is doing here in the United States. Uh, we do think that, the, uh, Paul said that nobody knows. I, I'm going to give you the answer. I know. Okay. Um, we think that the Federal Reserve is going to raise short-term interest rates when they meet in December. I believe it's December 16th and 17th. So the current Fed funds rate, which is the short-term interest rate that they set, it's been at zero since 2008. We think it's going to go up to a about a quarter of a percentage point. So they're going to raise it by a quarter of a percentage point. Now, still, interest rates are going to remain very, very low on a historical basis. So we expect to see one interest rate increase in December, and then three more interest rate increases over the course of 2016. So it's going to be a very, very gradual process of interest rate increases. The Federal Reserve thinks that the labor market is strong enough to handle it. We're seeing, as I mentioned, solid job growth, a decline in the unemployment rate. We're starting to see wage growth pick up, which is something that the Fed wants to see, so consumers can, can spend a little bit more. Um, and then we're, the Fed has also been looking at what's been going on with inflation. So we've had inflation, the Fed has set an inflation target of 2%. We've been consistently below that for years. 
Uh, but the Fed does think that inflation is set to pick up, particularly the impact of lower energy prices um, this starts to fade from the data. And so that will give the Fed the uh, um, confidence to raise interest rates. So we do expect to see a very, very gradual in increase in interest rates over the next few years. What that means is, is that makes the dollar more attractive to investors. So that means that the dollar is going to strengthen because at the same time, while the Fed is getting ready to raise rates, we've seen other central banks, the Bank of European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan in particular, become more aggressive. They've been doing the same things that our Federal Reserve did a few years ago in terms of buying long-term securities to push down long-term rates, that kind of thing. So that means we do expect the dollar to strengthen somewhat over the next year or so. Not as much as this 15% <coughs> excuse me, strengthening that we saw, maybe another 5% or so. But we do expect to see the stronger dollar over the next year, and that will be a weight on manufacturing growth. Um, the other big weight that we're seeing on manufacturing currently, and this is very, very important for Northeast Ohio, is the big downturn in energy production and investment in the indus energy industry. I know that this is very important in Northeast Ohio with the Utica Shale. Um, if we look at the orange line on the right-hand scale, that is the price of natural gas. Um, this only goes back a, a few years, but you can see, uh, you know, the price of natural gas has fallen from about 450 per million BTUs to about 250 per million BTUs. If I were to go back to 2005, natural gas would have been about $12 per million BTUs. So we've had a huge decline in natural gas prices. That has made drilling unproduct or un unprofitable in many places. And so we've seen a corresponding huge decline. The blue line on the left-hand scale, that's business investment in mining shafts and wells, uh, basically investment in energy infrastructure. And so that's fallen by about 50% just over the past few quarters. What goes into this equipment? Well, a lot of steel that's produced in Northeast Ohio, uh, a lot of other uh, goods that from, from this area that go into that type of business investment. So that's been a significant drag on manufacturing and on manufacturing in Northeast Ohio in particular. We don't think that natural gas prices are going to go up anytime soon. And so we don't, ex and we do think that we're going to see continued reduction in investment in energy development over the next couple of quarters. So this is going to remain a drag on growth, in manufacturing growth nationally and in Northeast Ohio at least until the second half of 2016. Um, now I gave you a, a litany of things about why there are problems in manufacturing and then I have a, a slide up here that says solid economic growth into 2017. Uh, you know, but if we look outside of manufacturing and particularly outside of export industries, uh, industries that are subject to import competition and then investment in energy, uh, we, conditions do look fairly solid. So we are seeing a recovery in home building. Uh, I mentioned the fact that the auto industry is doing quite well. Uh, that sales are very strong, that this is going to be the best year since 2000. And then generally we're, we're seeing consumers that are in good, if not uh, great shape. Uh, you know, we've had solid job growth, we've had solid wage growth, so consumers will continue to spend. Their balance sheets are in pretty good shape, so that's a positive for economic growth. Uh, so we expect to see growth over the next year or two of about 2 or 2.5%. Two that's what we've seen so far on average during this economic recovery. That's more than enough to keep up with normal growth in the labor force. And so what that means is, is that we will see a continued decline in the unemployment rate. Uh, the unemployment rate was at 5% in October. Uh, that's the lowest it's been since, I want to say, 2007. Um, and it is going to continue to decline. We expect it will uh, end this year maybe about 4.9%. Uh, and then gradually over the next year or so fall to what we consider full employment, which is somewhere around 4.6, 4.7%. More importantly, we're going to reduce the extra labor market slack that's out there. So we're going to see more people working full time. We're going to see people working at better jobs. And we're going to see stronger wage growth. Uh, how many of you are finding it difficult to find workers and are needing to raise wages in order to get workers? All right, I see it. Yeah, okay, we, we see a, a number of hands up there. You know, we've had announcements from companies like Walmart and Target that they're raising pay for their workers. We've had the United Auto Workers reach new agreements with GM and Fiat Chrysler that they're raising pay for their workers. Uh, we are seeing a tighter labor market supporting stronger wage growth, and that is going to be a positive for consumer spending over the next couple of years. 
Um, let me talk about some of the risks to the U.S. outlook. And a lot of these are internationally focused. The domestic fundamentals look pretty good, uh, but the concerns are, well, what's going on with China? We've seen slower economic growth in China. Uh, they were a big buyer of products from all over the world. Uh, uh, their economy has uh, experienced a significant slowing as they've cut back on their investment in infrastructure in particular. So that's been a drag on growth. Growth in China could slow even more than we're expecting, and so that could cause further problems for U.S. exporters. Uh, there's also the concern about the strong dollar. I mentioned that we expect the dollar to strengthen about 5% against other major currencies over the next year or so. Uh, but particularly if China decides to devalue its currency so that it um, is weaker against the U.S. dollar in order to encourage exports from China, uh, then that could be a further drag on U.S. economic growth. Um, you know, concerns about terrorism after the attacks in France and, and, and Lebanon that we've seen recently, uh, Greece and Europe. Uh, energy, I think, you know, that's both a positive and a negative. Consumers are benefiting greatly from the downturn in energy prices. Uh, you're spending, uh, you know, a, a dollar a gallon less now to fill up your gas tank than you did a year ago. Uh, that, can sa that saves consumers more than $100 billion annually uh, in lower gasoline prices. But at the same time, that does have negative implications for businesses in the energy industry and businesses that service the energy industry. But there is some upside out there in the U.S. economy as well. Uh, we could see a little bit stronger job growth than we're expecting, stronger gains in consumer income and consumer confidence to support consumer spending. Uh, commercial construction, uh, that's an area that is picking up and we could see stronger growth there as uh, vacancy rates continue to decline. So there definitely is some upside potential for the U.S. economy out there as well. Um, let's take a look at what happened with manufacturing in Northeast Ohio. So this is employment in manufacturing. Uh, I took a three-month average, uh, and then I set January of 2005 equal to 100. So this shows what happened during the recession. Nationally, uh, we lost about 15% of our jobs in manufacturing uh, between 2005 and the trough in 2009. The uh, situation was even worse in Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, and by Northeast Ohio, it, that is the uh, Cleveland metro area, the Akron metro area, the Canton metro area, and the Youngstown metro area. Uh, so we saw about a 25% decline in manufacturing employment in Northeastern Ohio. Um, a lot of this is because of the, in, uh, the area's ties to the automobile industry, which was hit significantly by the downturn. Uh, we saw auto sales fall from about 15 or 16 million units to about 9 million units at its worst. Um, so huge declines in that industry. But more generally, um, a lot of durable goods manufacturing in Northeast Ohio that suffered from the recession. And the hit to the local economy was magnified because the share of employment in manufacturing in Northeast Ohio is significantly above the national average. And so not only was Northeast Ohio hit by a bigger than average decline in manufacturing employment, but also it had more exposure to manufacturing, so this area was hit especially hard by the downturn. Uh, we did start to see manufacturing employment come back in 2009. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we're still down by about 10% from where we were prior to the recession. Uh, Northeast Ohio and Ohio generally down about 15% or so. Um, and you can see that, you know, there was nice rebound in Northeast Ohio for a, a few years, but over the past few years that uh, employment and manufacturing in Ohio has essentially been flat. Uh, so while the rest of the nation has been seeing job gains in manufacturing over the past few years, that hasn't been the case in Northeast Ohio. Uh, output has been increasing. But workers are more productive as businesses invest in equipment that makes them uh, able to produce more, uh, you know, cost-saving uh, devices. Uh, and at the same time, the downturn in, in energy investment has hit this area hard, although it has been, uh, the Northeast Ohio has benefited from the turnaround in the auto industry, as we mentioned. Um, we, Paul mentioned our small business survey. We actually interview small business owners in Ohio about conditions. And we generally find that small business owners in Ohio are, are less optimistic than small business owners nationally. So this is the share of uh, respondents who are talking about their expected sales over the next six months. Uh, you can see this share that expects their sales to increase over the next six months is significantly lower in, in Ohio than it is in the rest of the country. Now this is the entire state, not just Northeast Ohio. Uh, but generally, small business owners in Ohio are less optimistic about their sales over the next six months. 
Uh, they're less optimistic about the local economy over the next six months. You can see that the blue bar, the optimistic bar, is smaller for Ohio than it is for the rest of the U.S. And the pessimist, pessimistic bar, the orange at the bottom, is larger. And then they also have more subdued hiring plans than in the rest of the United States. Now, that being said, we still have the share of respondents who say that they're going to hire is larger than the share of respondents who say that they're going to cut back on their staffing. So we will see job growth in Ohio over the next couple of uh, six months or so, uh, but more subdued than what we're seeing in the rest of the United States. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the materials that we produce. Uh, we do a U.S. write-up once a month. Uh, in, uh, we also do a Northeastern Ohio write-up twice a year. I believe you have a copy of that. Uh, but we produce a, a, a write-up twice a month or twice a year on Northeast Ohio. We also do write-ups on the latest economic data as, it re, as it's released. So, for example, when the Federal Reserve does decide to raise rates in December, and I'm, I'm betting money on that, uh, you can read about our response to that. Uh, you can see that at pnc.com slash economic reports. And then I have Q&A up there. We're actually not going to take Q&A right now. Uh, we're going to take Q&A at the end. But thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be back up north again. I've lived in Columbus for all of about four weeks. Uh, but I'm also delighted to be affiliated with the Ohio Manufacturing Institute at The Ohio State University. Uh, Catherine Kelly is here. Catherine, please stand up. She's the director of the Institute. Um, and what you're going to be hearing out of Ohio State coming over the next six months is a, a major commitment of the university towards manufacturing statewide. Uh, there's some terrific inventions coming out of the College of Engineering. Uh, there's going to be, uh, we're, 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 we've reached out, we're going to be working with Magnet on some of the uh, customized engineer products that are come taking place. So I'm just absolutely thrilled that Dean Williams has decided he's going to rejuvenate what's taking place in engineering technology. He's going to be really committing uh, the university to, to applied research and applied engineering uh, to help companies in the state of Ohio. Uh, and you're going to see a university-wide push in the areas of materials, welding, and uh, we're, we're, we're even getting the business school to figure out that manufacturing is with us all the way. So that's just, just fabulous. The reception's been great. Um, if you have any specific questions, talk to Catherine, um, and I'll, I'm totally irresponsible, so don't trust me. All right. Now, uh, my presentation, what Gus said. Okay, I'm done. All right. Uh, my, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the manufacturing side. Uh, my, I, the, the tit I titled this Disturbance in the Force. There's some parts of data that keep starting to bother me a bit, keeping me awake, particularly when it comes to uh, the manufacturing sector. Gus hit a lot of it, and um, the stuff that he covered, I'll just go through quickly. Um, again, what, this is a graph. The red line is potential GDP. The blue line is actual GDP. The exciting thing about that is normally they travel closely together. The Great Recession was just about a heart attack or a stroke to the economy, and it's nice to see not only recovery, but the recovery and going towards potential is accelerating. That is fabulous. By the way, um, you are hearing some wonderful economic debate in the presidential debates. It's the, the presidential debates, they are actively debating economic policy that's totally appropriate for 1880. <laughs> These guys, this group is scaring the living hell out of me when it comes to, the, to the, their notion that the macro economy doesn't exist. But outside of that, I'll be bipartisan. The Democrats chanting for $15 an hour minimum wages has me about equally as upset. So I am looking forward to two years of being a complete freaking grump. This is going to be great. <laughs> um, th this is the 12 month quarterly average change in GDP, very similar to, to what Gus showed, hovering around 2%, which is great. The uh, largest constraint on GDP going forward is going to start being labor. And uh, that is just a very different world for us to be in. Uh, but right now, uh, you, saw, you see it spiky. This isn't seasonally adjusted. And we're hovering and bringing back down to between 2 and 3%, which is about what you would expect uh, this far into recovery. What I do want to point out is that this recovery has been going on for now for a very long time. The problem is for everyone in the room, it hasn't felt like that. It's only felt like it's been going on for about a year, year and a half. So now we have to begin to start paying attention less to the rebound from the US and much more of what's happening in fundamental markets around us. 
The good thing is labor market's improving. That's absolutely genuine. No sign of inflation anywhere on the horizon. Uh, the, what's going on with fuel and energy prices is the stimulus that the U.S. economy currently has. It has some regional impacts. But for manufacturing, the strengthening of the dollars is a real concern. The slowdown in Europe, particularly as, as we compete in machine tools, is real. Uh, and uh, China is a huge market for the United States, and they are going through a, a major correction uh, right uh, as we speak. So we'll be looking at this. Changing jobs in the United States, despite all the gloom that nothing's happened in the U.S., we're up about four million jobs from where we were at the um, at, at the start of at the start of the Great Recession. I, I, I think of this is a piano graph. This is like looking at my grandmother's piano from the top, and now all of a sudden we have a small harpsichord off to the side, so that's great. We need to see that. However, in the state of Ohio, we have not gotten back to where we were at the start of the Great Recession. However, this is a very confusing labor market in the state. Uh, it's confusing because while we don't have the total number of jobs back, our gross domestic product is going up at a very high rate. Productivity is very high. And what we're really seeing is government employment just hasn't come back at all. And that has been a public policy decision on the part of the Kasich administration and the legislature to, to, to pare back uh, government employment. And it's been very effective. Uh, in the U.S. as a whole, uh, the red line is uh, private employment. This is the growth rate in private employment. The blue line is the growth rate in government employment. Nationally, government employment has come back. So it's come back to about where we were back in 1980. Uh, it's, now it's come back to, to zero growth rate as opposed to a negative growth rate. So we stopped shedding government jobs. On the other hand, private sector jobs are there. And one of the leading indicators of what's happening in the economy is paying attention to temporary help and temporary employment. And temporary employment is still growing, but that growth rate's slowing down, which is what we want to see. Normally, when you, go, when you go through a turnaround and recession, you rely on temp agencies very heavily because you don't want to lay anybody off again. It's too painful. And as you see business conditions improve, you start adding to your permanent workforce. But we're still seeing a very large contingent workforce in the economy as a whole. And that is of concern. And luckily, this is a sign that more people are hiring permanently and using fewer temps. Um, unemployment rates, uh, this is uh, well, if this is an um, EKG, someone had troubles, but they are alive. Uh, but anyway, the uh, black line is the unemployment rate in the United States. The red line is the unemployment rate in Ohio. Blue line is the average of the unemployment rate in all of our border, border states plus Illinois. Why did we make Illinois an honorary border state? It's because we compete a lot with them when it comes to work activity jobs and in the manufacturing sector. The good news for Ohio is our unemployment rate has been consistently lower than those in our surrounding states, plus Illinois, and, um, and the United States, and that's continuing. However, what we do have, and one of the things that's, that's fooling all of those numbers, is this large number of people that still aren't actively involved in the labor market. Gus talked about this, and um, it, we're going to see them come in. But, part, but our challenge is we've got a large number of kids that have no or very limited work experience starting to be attracted back into the market. And we have numbers of older adults who basically have been sitting on the beach without being able to afford lunch uh, for a long period of time starting to come back in the labor market. You as employers are going to have to start to judge how much experience you're going to want for these people who have been damaged for the labor market for a period of time. In my industry, education, we love it. We say, fool the employer, come in and pretend you've, been, you've learned something for a couple years, go out again, and they'll think you're productive. So that's really good. Um, the, now, what, this is what's going on. This is a labor force participation rate. So this is the share of the population that's either employed or actively looking for work. This is, there are a couple things on here that are quite striking. The green line is for uh, the prime age adults, 25 to 54. That number is about 81%, which is very low compared to historical terms. Uh, but, it's, it, but what we're seeing here is it's, it's dropping. And so part of we, what we have to understand is what's happening to the prime age workers so that 20% of them are off sitting on the sidelines. Some of it's marriage, some of it's military, some of it's prison, uh, but some of it is not being engaged. The blue line are young adults, 20 to 24-year-olds. These are the people who are shopping around looking for their careers, 
And what we're finding is about 30% of them aren't engaged in the labor market. Again, that's concerning. It's dropping. And it also means that those of you who are, who are looking to hire, you have to start wondering where people are getting their experience from. And finally, the red line is the one that really keeps me up at night. Uh, this is the uh, work experience of teenagers. And that now is historically as low as it's ever been. For those of us who spend our lives on our cell phone, you know, wife has a cell phone, husband has a cell phone, it's not because of work, it's to avoid the child abandonment charges as you're overworking. And your kid is highly engaged with all kinds of activities. I don't worry about that kid not working, but I do worry about the large number of kids that come home from school, they sit in their house, their apartment, and they out, aren't out working. I got a, a question here. Raise your hand, I did this last year, you might remember this test. For those of you that started work as a teenager, working for a factory or a warehouse, or working for an adult who wasn't your parent, put them on up. All right, keep them up there for a second. All of you who are current, oh, you can look around too, it's okay. It's most of the room. All of you who currently are employing someone like that in your shop, in your company today, keep your hand up. All right, folks, now we've seen the problem. We've, we, we're going to have to take this thing on. We have a lot of kids that are growing up in job deserts, kids growing up in places that I call job oases with a lot of jobs not connecting to their neighborhoods. And all that stuff that made you a good employee took a place around the dining table of your family or you learned it on the job working for someone else. And Taco Bell, where you get in squirt gun fights with those little, you know, you know the caulking guns they use to stuff the, t the tacos with, that doesn't count. All right? But we really now have to really worry about, and, I, and by the way, I am very concerned about an overemphasis on STEM education in the United States and an underestimate on, on experiential learning because we got, this is where people pick up their habits for work. But that's a different lecture and a harangue, so I'll keep going. Um, but now, these are the annual labor force participation rates for the, for the entire economy, uh, where you've got U.S. in green, uh, Ohio in blue, and our competing states in red. Um, again, what you see is the labor force participation rate in Ohio is actually higher than the bordering states. That's kind of a good thing, but why is it high? Is it because we're much more dedicated than those lazy oafs in Pennsylvania and Illinois? Absolutely. No, it's because we're older. And, and it's the lack of kids and the fact that we're going to birth their, their generation is giving us that, that, the, the higher labor force participation rate. So this whole issue around kids and the, work, and the way in which they engage with the workforce is serious business. Um, the, uh, when it comes to work itself, it's life, we get really excited and happy when the, when, the number, when the average work week goes above 39 hours because that means some people are doing overtime, more people are hiring. Uh, so we're getting, we're getting closer to that. You'll notice that we were well above it before the recession hit, well below it during the recession. It's a little spiky. These aren't seasonally adjusted, but those are starting to go up, and that's good. The more that you guys have to face paying overtime, the more you start figuring out, that does, is it worthwhile paying, paying the fixed cost of bringing somebody on full time? So that's, that's good news. Uh, two measures of the unemployment rate. This is the unemployment rate that gets reported. Those are people who are actively either work, uh, is the number of working or actively seeking work. Uh, no, those are the people who are not employed but actively seeking work. It's just right around 5%. And as Gus told you, the expectation is it's going to go lower. Um, and it's going to be buffered as people get attracted into the labor market. But here's the problem. This is the underemployment rate. The underemployment rate is about twice the em employment rate. And that is, while it's coming get down, it's coming down rapidly, that's something we're going to have to start paying attention to going forward. Uh, other good news when it comes to manufacturing is that owner's equity in real estate nearly doubled from the bottom of the recession, uh, so that the value of equity people have in their homes is almost back up to the, uh, to the peak, which was frothy and bubbly. Uh, but that also means that people are dealing with, with, with they aren't remortgaging their houses, more equity going into their houses. Um, and that says good things when people actually come to fix houses, ability to sell them, and, um, and also rent. The, the, that, and the other thing that's really good is deleveraging is taking place in the housing market. Mortgage, this is mortgage, mortgage debt as a percent of home equity. Uh, it isn't down to where I would like to see it. I'd like to see it in the 60 to 65% range, 
uh, but we're down below 80 percent. It's a hell of a lot better when we when the um, leverage in housing in the United States started to resemble either Greek debt or the state of Illinois' bond rating, one or the other. Take your choice. Uh, so that's good news, very good news. So when, as people start dealing and re resolving their debt, it allows them to go out and get in the hock once again, but hopefully much more responsibly. Energy prices are clearly the stimulus. Uh, the black line is the price of natural gas coming out of the Henry Hub. That's kind of the national marker for, for natural gas. Uh, the blue line is the, uh, is the price for West Virginia sweet oil. And the red line is, uh, is Brent, which is the European price. Couple things uh, to pay attention to. Uh, the most important is I paid less than $2 a gallon coming up here. Uh, so it just made me want to drive another 50 miles. I was heading towards Toronto. Uh, the second thing that's, that's going on, though, is that you're seeing that the price, uh, the, the European and US clearing prices have now merged. Uh, where is the price of oil going to be? If you thought we didn't know what's going on with interest rates, we sure as hell don't know what's going on with oil except for a couple things. One is it's not going north of $80 a barrel anytime soon. Second, we know that Iran and Iraq have large amounts of oil ready to come into the marketplace, and uh, that OPEC has decided that they are going to preserve their market share to come hell or high water, and they're trying to force fracking oil out of the marketplace. Uh, so as we look forward for the next two, three, four, five years, Oil is going to be driving energy prices, and we don't see it going up for, for a long time. The other thing that's going on is uh, natural gas prices. This is the price of natural gas coming out of the Henry Hub, um, and uh, Gus covered it well. These are the two hubs that, are, that take uh, natural gas out of the Marcellus and the Utica. What is really important and impressive in the middle of this is that Gas coming out of the Henry Hub is about two dollars a million. Uh, a, 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 uh, let me say a million cubic feet. Uh, coming out of Dominion South, which does uh, a good chunk of the Marcellus, that gas price is now almost at a buck. Uh, and if you look at coming out of Columbia Gas a little bit further on up uh, and, and does a lot of Eastern Ohio, that's below two dollars a million cubic feet. That does two things: number of drilling rigs. Well, three things. Things. Number of drilling rigs is going down. Um, I think you, Jurgens makes fracking blocks here, right? We supply parts for them. Yeah, all right, you we supply for them. A lot more. Okay. The second thing, uh, so, so that, that's coming on down. We know that the number of rigs is holding steady at about 20 rigs in Ohio. Those rigs are much more efficient. They're, they're drawing larger laterals. They're taking, getting more gas out of it. So development in the field is continuing just at a slower rate. Second thing we know is that the midstream uh, uh, infrastructure in the fields, which is all the pipelines, we had a real problem is that it lied behind drilling. It's now catching up. It'll be catching up, Paul, for what, the next two, three years, I believe. So there's lots of activity going on there connecting us. The third thing that's really important is that the price of ethane coming out of those mills, we got out of, those, out of the ground, we've got lots of natural gas liquids. The price of ethane is cheaper here than anywhere outside of the Gulf. That's the Gulf in, in uh, the Middle East, not the goal from Louisiana. Uh, so that means that we are very optimistic that we're going to start seeing crackers showing up in this region over the next five years. Uh, Shell is moving for it to, moving towards build their cracker west of Pittsburgh. It's, it's reclaiming an old lead, lead factory site. Um, and uh, that's going through the permit process. There's a cracker in Belmont County that started going through the permit process in, in Ohio, in about a year, you're going to hear a decision as to whether it gets built or not. I think that's going to be between a five and an eight billion dollar investment. I keep on hearing billion is a big number. <laughs> so that while people are getting too depressed about what's going on in our oil fields, realize that what's important for manufacturing is having a local spot market of ethane and its derivatives. Ethylene is very important to us, and we find it turns out that we've got a transportation cost advantage when it comes to the eth ethylene that can be produced here. We also have the ability to do customized compounding once when those crackers come online. This is very exciting. The important win for the gas development for Ohio and Pennsylvania is not in the jobs running the field. It's the jobs in the revitalized manufacturing sector that have access to a spot market and uh, access to customization when it comes to um, the, uh, ethylene and polyethylene itself. The other thing that is just fabulous about this is that this is not a short-term play. 
This is a 30 to 40 year play. So it's gonna fundamentally change things. So for manufacturers, there are a couple things that are really important they are gonna be offsetting some of the headwinds of high cost uh, by coming up from the dollar. Cheap energy is way up there. It's hugely important. The second thing that's really, really important will be, will be spot markets taking place in the ethylene and polyethylene markets starting in about three to five years. Pay attention to it. And for those of you who got manufacture things that look like giant chemistry sets, there are three incredibly big chemistry sets that should be built uh, somewhere in the tri-state region. I am so delighted that the three states are playing nice on this one rather than squabbling and screwing it up. So that's, that's, that's important. Damn, I actually got optimistic for a second. Let me, I'll turn into Darth Vader in a, in a bit. Um, the issue for manufacturing, Paul gave you this, the, the word on, 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 on production. What's really interesting is capacity utilization seems to be stuck south of 80%. How can that be when we've been going like crazy? Well, what's going on is all you people in this room are so freaking smart, you figured out how to get more capacity out of your current plant. And what you're doing is you're investing in very smart machine tools. And you're investing in a completely, and you're redoing your plants and you're redoing your lines so that you are squeezing more out of those four walls than you ever thought could have been possible. So the end result is we're seeing recapitalization take place in your plants. We aren't seeing many new plants being built. Um, and so that 80%, we aren't going to see a lot of new plants until we get above that 80% level line and you folks start walling out. And when you wall out, then, oh yeah, your planning instincts really show up. You're gonna say, I want a new plant in three months. All right, by the way, we can't do that. All right, next, uh, this is what's going on in, 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 in uh, manufacturing. Germany calls it Industry 4.0. I call it the fourth industrial revolution. What it really is is the complete digitization of the factory floor. It is it's having all of your machine tools and all of your inventory lined up with your, your ERP, lined up with your customer's ERP. Oh yeah, Walmart will figure out when you dress and undress, there's no question about it, and they'll charge you for the privilege. But more importantly, with, with Industry 4.0, is that those companies that can figure out how to integrate their, their shop floor digitally, and figure out how to attune their workforce to take advantage of it, they're gonna win. And one of the things that, that Catherine and I are, are, are starting to talk to our colleagues at Ohio State about is we have to focus on how small to mid-sized firms can take access to the digital factory. Uh, Germany is way ahead of us on this, and it's a huge issue for the competitiveness of this region that makes certain our small to mid-sized firms aren't priced out of this change in machine tools, which is coming. Uh, Industry 4.0, yeah, my, my, my graph got chopped, but this is the story. Red line is employment and manufacturing. The green line is the real value of manufactured output, and the black line is uh, real output per worker, which went slightly off the graph because uh, Data Zoa cut it on off. But when people are saying manufacturing's not growing, what is the proper response when they tell you that in a cocktail party? If you've had three drinks, look them straight in the eye and say bullshit. Because the fact is, it isn't growing in terms of, of total employment, it's changing in terms of who you're employing. And it's growing like crazy when it comes to the value of output. And as we go forward, you're facing another revolution as to how to manage your companies and your plants. And it is all about investment and how you invest wisely. Um, our manufacturing orders, ordering new tools, this is non-defense capital goods. This is what I really pay attention to. It doesn't include aircraft. It's been kind of stuck, but it, it peaked in um, 2015. And part of that, there are two sorts of uncertainty. What's going on with your customers? The other is these new machines you have to buy are so expensive, you gotta think about it. And so you're thinking about it to the point where if there's lots of economic uncertainty, should I spend $300,000 for that machine? Or you go see Uncle PNC and say, hey, take a risk, I'm good for it. Okay. So we're paying a lot of attention to this particular data series. Automobile production, around 300,000 units a month, that's all good, uh, that's in the US. I pay attention to US production more than I pay attention to sales because some people do buy, um, um, uh, let's see, diesel engine cars where they lie about the results so you feel good about it until the, the, the truth is told. All right, uh, but the fact is that there is a lot, expansion is taking place in Mexico versus the United States when it comes to, to new plants at this point. And we've got some concerns about that. But the 300,000 units a month is great. And I've got to tell you, some days I get grumpy about unions, but when it comes to keeping 
that cheap plant in, to in Toledo, I thank the UAW every single day. Because if it wasn't for the UAW, we wouldn't have Avon Lake and we wouldn't have um, uh, Toledo going forward. Um, annualized automobile light truck sales going on up. Uh, we know that, uh, that the, at the age of the automobile fleet is still historically old, partially because they're better than ever and the engines last for 200,000 miles, partially because of the, the, the great spread in the income distribution, only rich people can afford new cars. Uh, and so mm -hmm. then what we've got is an entire part of our labor force totally dependent on beaters. That's the reason why they show up late on Monday mornings, so I'm sure. Um, now, dollars, yeah, this makes me really grumpy. Uh, the trade weighted average of the dollar has gone up by 12.1% this year. Um, and um, that is a headwind that you're going against. Uh, partially offset by energy costs. Has to be offset by intellectual property in your product so you stop having commodities. Because if you're in a commodity business, the next three years are going to get increasingly tougher. Uh, looking at some, some in particular, this, whoops. This is what's going on with the ratio of the dollar uh, to the euro. Uh, for some reason, the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank has it reversed, so think of this upside down. And for some reason, also, my computer wasn't getting the Fed data in right by, through Excel. But anyway, what's going on is the value of the euro is tanking. And with the tragedy that's taken place in France over the past couple of weeks, the immigrant crisis, this is an oh my god moment. Uh, it also means that Germany uh, in particular, and Italian machine tools are going to get a lot more competitive for the next couple of years. Uh, so that means we got to get smarter on it. Uh, this line is, uh, this is uh, the GDP in Europe. Uh, they have gone, it, 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 Europe never really came out of the recession. Uh, and that's a concern because they're an important trading partner. What's good for us is Mexico's doing well, Canada is slowing down but doing well. So, so the NAFTA block is what dri is driving the U.S. economy. Uh, the yen is kind of dropping. It's, it's managed, so it's not dropping a lot. But what is, uh, oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm getting my currency screwed, screwed up. Uh, so what's going on is the uh, Japanese yen is dropping in value. The days of 108 yen to the dollar are long gone. Uh, but the bad news for us is that Japan officially entered a recession last week. Uh, of course, it happened earlier than that, but they, they're stalling out again. They've got demographic problems, they've got, debt, they've got debt overhang, and they're having trouble competing with China. Speaking of China, the official term is, is an ex economic deceleration. The, value, the real GDP growth is it's still growing, but the growth rate is dropping. No one really knows where the number is. Somewhere between 6 and 7 percent is the best guess. Uh, Gary Schilling had a really interesting piece in... Um, uh, Barron, was it Barron's? No. Um, um, who are the ones that, oh, Bloomberg, uh, yesterday, uh, which kind of walks you through different parts of the China economy. The important thing is, if you're in China, be in China for the right reasons. If you're in China, into the consumer market, realize that their middle class, while a small percentage of their um, population is bigger than the entire middle class in the United States, a little less wealthy. Uh, if you're in China and you're, you're using it as an export platform, Realize that what we're seeing is more OEMs with sophisticated products are shortening up their supply chains because they learned from Fukushima, they learned from the floods in Thailand, they're still price competitive. So what we're seeing is regionalized supply chains popping up along the, around the globe. We're seeing a North American supply chain, we're seeing an Asian supply chain, starts of, of a supply chain uh, going in around Europe. Uh, and when we get done with all this, on the whole, I'm optimistic of, slow, of a slow growth future. For manufacturing, I'm concerned about what's going on with the value dollar because it's going to keep on going up for the next two years. Uh, I am optimistic about what energy prices can do for you. For, for Northeast Ohio, I'm very optimistic about the long-term future of natural gas and plastics. Oh yeah, we can all watch the graduate again. Um, but it's going to take three years coming. So this is one, a point in time where it's probably, ever since we've gone through the recession, now is the point in time to really pay attention to your order books. The best data you're going to have about what's going on in the economy is what's showing up in your books. It's also going to be really important to use your sales force, not only to, well, it's really important that they sell something, or else who needs them, but use them as intelligence of what's going on inside your supply base, your customer base. 
Autos are going to continue to grow. Growth rates are going to be slow. Aircraft is going to continue to grow and grow quite rapidly for the next several years. In this region, we're deep in the supply chain for GE lo locomotive. The indications are that's continuing to grow. So the, everything within the North American market is really good. Uh, but what's going on with our international markets, it, it, uh, remember that Mexico and Canada are really foreign countries. Uh, what, what's happening in the other markets is that there are real headwinds and slow growth. So once again, the U.S. is putting the world economy on its back and carrying it forward. What really keeps me awake at night is our ability to counteract a small recession has been greatly diminished. Greatly diminished, one, because the Fed doesn't have a lot of buffer room to goose things along anymore. That's one of the reasons why raising interest rates is good. The other reason is we need rates of return so that people stop doing speculative bubbles. So that's all good. But I'm really concerned about Congress's ability to fa finance a stimulus or approve a stimulus is about at zero. And if the stupid ideological debate keeps on going, and we keep on forgetting that we are an integrated national economy, and that Keynes really was right, our ability to counteract a, a, a recession politically is going to be greatly diminished in the next, next two years. Politics is the greatest threat to the economy going forward. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, real quick, the folks in the back, can you see the slides up here on the screen? Just show me a, a yeah, I got a thumbs up up there. Good, good. All right, so pleasure to be here today. Uh, similar to uh, Gus and Ned, I'm going to share uh, some data with you this morning, uh, specifically on Northeast Ohio manufacturers and employers relative to compensation uh, practices. Uh, and we're going to do something a little bit different. So in addition to that data piece, I'm also going to spend some time uh, talking to you about some of the pitfalls that we see at ERC that employers fall into when they're analyzing and they're looking at this data and trying to figure out how do you use this. So we're going to jump right in. So ERC, Employers Resource Council, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we've been around for 95 years and one of the cornerstones of the services we provide for businesses in Northeast Ohio are benchmark reports. So we survey local employers on their compensation benefits uh, wages, policies, practices, and then we report that back out to the community. So a lot of the information I'm going to share with you today is collected by ERC directly from Northeast Ohio employers and manufacturers. So the first uh, graph we have up here is from uh, what we call our wage and salary adjustment survey, and this looks at uh, overall projections for uh, annual wage increases, and then also uh, in addition to those projections, what the actual increases were. And, and very similar to, I think, some of the information that Ned and Gus has showed, uh, we had a dip during the recession, uh, but we haven't fully come out of that. We haven't fully recovered in terms of wage increases, and that probably won't surprise a lot of you. So if you were to take this graph and go back another 10 or 15 or 20 years, on an annual basis, we saw average base wage and salary increases around 4 and a half, 5 percent That was pretty common. Uh, and to borrow a phrase that Ned used quite a bit there, you know, those days are gone. Those days are gone. We're seeing much more along the lines of 25 to 3% being much more common, much more consistent. So when you hear that wage growth is stagnant or wages are stagnant, uh, based on this measure, that's certainly something that we've seen in Northeast Ohio. Now, when you take a deeper dive and you look at manufacturers specifically over that same period of time, and you break it down by different position groups, again, you see very similar trends and a couple outliers. So for example, the green, yellow, and blue lines you see right here, that's a majority of the people that we employ. So that are gonna be, you know, there's gonna be your production, maintenance, service, engineering, technical, professional, administrative, management positions. Uh, their lines follow a very similar pattern to that previous graph. Uh, the two outliers, uh, executives, the executive group tends to, on average, get larger base pay increases on an annual basis. Again, probably won't surprise anyone. Uh, and the outlier on the bottom here, we have unionized production service and maintenance employees tend to lag behind the other groups. But point of this graph, very consistent with overall trends with employers through Northeast Ohio. So the increases to those base rates have been consistently pretty low, right? At least historically. But organizations are providing increases. So we saw a dip in the recession. We saw a lot of uh, pay freezes uh, being implemented. And we've kind of come out of that. So we're actually back at levels uh, like we saw before the recession where 95, 96% of the folks that we're surveying are saying, yes, we're going to uh, increase pay 
uh, this year uh, or we did in the previous year. Okay, so what does that mean? All right, if we dig a little bit deeper here, again, looking at manufacturers specifically, who got those pay freezes? Very consistent uh, with what we saw before uh, in the previous chart. Again, if we look at the specific position groups, the outliers again, interestingly, uh, executives uh, tended to get the most pay freezes over that period of time, at least the base pay, at least the base pay. This does not include incentive pay, bonuses, stock options, and those sorts of things. Uh, and again, uh, the union uh, production service and maintenance employees uh, again, they tended to receive uh, a bulk of those uh, uh, pay freezes over time. But we're back down here again. Very few groups are planning, very few uh, employers are planning uh, pay freezes uh, throughout 2015, 2016. So bottom line here, Northeast Ohio manufacturers, okay, we're increasing wages. We are, but only by a little bit, right? Only by a little bit. And when we dig even deeper and we look at individual positions, and this is a sampling of jobs that we survey on an annual basis, in our uh, ERC wage survey, and I think many of you in this room have participated in that. And this is just you know, a sample of some key positions, common positions we see uh, at Northeast Ohio manufacturers. And what's interesting about this over the last five years is you don't see a lot of movement. You don't see a lot of variance. So again, kind of reinforcing that idea that base pay rates, two and a half, three percent, you know, if that, that's, that's you know, at the individual position level, we're seeing that as well where we see a little more differentiation or a little more consistency in terms of an upward trend are positions that are more along the lines of uh, uh, more skilled manufacturing. So if you look at CNC operators, for example, you see more of an upward trend there consistently uh, over time. So what does that mean? So I just threw a lot of data at you, right? And incidentally, all the information I'm sharing today, you're gonna be able to download uh, these slides. So if you were, I don't know if anybody's trying to write anything down, uh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get that out to you. You know, one of the things that we see, or one of the pitfalls that we see uh, with employers that access this information from us is that they don't know what to do next. And a lot of times employers tend to be very reactive. So you're looking for this information because somebody came into your office and said, I need a raise. Or you're looking to hire somebody, and it's like, okay, we gotta put together a good offer, and we're going back and forth, we're negotiating here a little bit tend to be very reactive. You might not see the big picture in those moments. So what I want to do is spend the rest of the time here talking a little bit about what some of those pitfalls can be and how to avoid them. Does that sound good? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I want to tell you a quick story here. Uh, I've got a six-year-old son who is incredibly curious. Uh, matter of fact, his favorite TV show is How It's Made. So I actually came home from work yesterday and he's watching how it's made. He loves to figure out how do things work and why do they work. So he asked me a question a couple weeks ago. He says, Daddy, uh, how does the air stay on the earth? So that's a really interesting question. So, so okay, so we talked about, oh, there's gravity and there's electromagnetic fields that protect us from the sun's rays and this and that. And so, so there's no air in space. So yeah, well, space is a vacuum, right? There's no air in space. He says, well, what happens if you went into space without a space suit? So, okay. So we talked about that. So, well, you're going to run out of air, you know, you, you won't be able to breathe, you'll eventually freeze, and any exposed moisture is going to boil, there's no air pressure, da, 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 the whole thing. So it's bad. Yeah, yes, it's bad. You don't want to be in a vacuum without a spacesuit. Well, it's the same thing for survey data, right? You don't want to review your survey information on wages and salaries in a vacuum because it's bad. Bad things happen. If you don't get the big picture, you might come to certain conclusions that aren't necessarily accurate. So if I just stopped at the information I shared with you this morning already and said, okay, that's it, take, with, take it with you, make decisions based on that, uh, that would be pretty irresponsible. I would feel pretty irresponsible. So let me demonstrate that. So we do a survey every year. We've been doing this for about 17 years in a row now with Smart Business Magazine. And we ask local employers a number of questions on the workplace practices, one of which is, what's your biggest challenge? And year after year, for almost all of those years we've done the survey, the number one cited biggest challenge is finding and keeping qualified workers. That's number one. Matter of fact, not only is it number one, but as this graph shows, uh, the blue bars are, are representative of the percentage of employers that said, this is our biggest challenge, relative to the orange bars, which show all of the other challenges combined. So we see this in our data, and we realize you know, very quickly, this is a challenge for employers. This is a challenge for manufacturers, finding and keeping qualified people, right? And we hear it anecdotally. 
and we saw some hands go up earlier. So we know that this is a problem. So then the next question is, what, what can we do about it, right? How do we better attract and retain great people? How do we find and keep those qualified workers? So uh, Ned mentioned in my bio, uh, ERC does a program every year called the North Coast 99. Are people here familiar with that? Show of hands, a couple folks, good. So North Coast 99 program, for those of you who aren't aware of what it is, it's an annual program that recognizes some of the best places to work throughout Northeast Ohio. And specifically what we look for are organizations that excel at attracting and retaining top performing people. And as part of our evaluation process, we ask those organizations who apply to survey a population of their top performing people in their current workforce. And we ask them a number of different questions about the company, but we also ask them, what's most important to you in a job? So as a top performing person at ABC company, what is it that you're looking for? And our results year after year have been very consistent and reflective of what we saw this past year. So in 2015, we surveyed close to 9,000 top performing people throughout Northeast Ohio, and this is what they told us was most important to them. At the top of the list, number one, challenging and meaningful work. May not surprise some of you. You hear a lot in the news, particularly with the millennial generation, that they're looking for meaning, they're looking to make a difference, they're looking for purpose, right? Matter of fact, as a side note, our data actually says something a little different about millennials, which I'll share in a moment. But number two is compensation. You know, what I, what I earn is really important to me. Now, you've probably heard over the years that, well, pay is not the most important thing, culture, other things are really important. That, yeah, okay, that's true. But compensation is still really important. It shouldn't be neglected. It shouldn't be tossed aside, right? This influences your ability to attract and retain great people. Make no mistake. And as a matter of fact, when we segment this based on generational groups, compensation was actually number one for the millennials in our study. Now, if you think about it, millennials aren't just the folks coming right out of school anymore, okay? There's certainly a, a portion of those who are still coming into the workforce, but you've got a lot of people in their early to mid-30s who are starting families, who have mortgages, who have cars, who have loan payments still, have a lot of debt, right? So purpose, meaning, important, but to that group, you know, show me the money, right? I've got bills to pay. So it's something very interesting to keep in mind. So we dig a little bit deeper then, right? So compensation, that's gonna drive your ability. Again, probably won't surprise you, but it does play an important role, a very important role in your ability to attract and retain great people. So how, you know, what do these North Coast 99 winners do? Well, when we look at the manufacturers who won our award, there were about a dozen out of the 99 companies this past year, on average, their pay increases for their top performing people were close to 5%. So I share that information with you because I want to put the previous slides in a little bit of context. When you see two and a half, three percent, and you see that over five years, six years, seven years, uh, it's very easy to fall into a trap that says, in isolation, wow, well, okay, as long as we're doing this, we're keeping up with everybody, right? Everybody else is doing this, so we're doing okay. Let's let's three three percent across the board. Here's some other data that might suggest, well, okay, you can do that, but if you want to excel at attracting and retaining top performing people, you might need to reconsider, right? So again, don't look at data in isolation. All right, moving on. Another story. So I come from a long line of family members with uh, uh, fun, fun circumstances like hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and salt uh, is a big point of contention in our family because we love our salt, all right? So I happen to marry a dietitian, and she doesn't love salt. And as a matter of fact, my father and her like to debate back and forth quite a bit uh, about the merits of salt and how much he should be taking in on a daily basis, right? So much so that what he loves to do is go to the internet, let's say around Thanksgiving time, and pull up a bunch of articles and stories and studies that show salt is the best thing on the planet Earth. You should be pouring it into your coffee, you should be pouring it on your bagels, you should be pouring it into your breakfast cereal, right? And he'll present that to her and say, see, salt's good for you. Which of course drives her nuts, right? So it's a fun story, but I think it illustrates something that we see all the time. And it's another pitfall in terms of working with wage and salary data. And I'll phrase it this way, convenience does not equal relevance. So just because you can find information easily, AKA free, doesn't mean it's the best. And number two, just because it supports what you already thought doesn't mean it's right either. Which is exactly what my father does, right? He just pulls up the first thing he finds and hey, that 
Sounds like what I believe, so here you go. It must be true. And we see that happen a lot with wage and salary data. We get calls from organizations say, okay, we need, we, we're hiring a new sales manager in Denver, and can you get us some salary data? Sure. We'll pull information from multiple sources, send it over to them, they'll get back to us, and they say, well, that's too high. <laughs> right? That's too, well, the data are what they are. You know, it's too high, low, you know. They are what they are. So convenience isn't relevant. How do you know what is relevant? How do you know what is accurate, what is reliable? So there are a few key things that you want to look for when you're considering a compensation uh, survey source. And for some of you, this might be old hat. You know this. For some of you, this might be new information. And for, I think for most of you, it will be common sense. But the reality is that when you're looking for information or people in your company are looking up information for you, Okay, and it's, hey, we need this by our three o'clock meeting, they're gonna sometimes pull the first thing they can find. And it may not meet these different requirements. So first thing is measures of central tendency, okay? The information I shared with you earlier were average wages. And averages are okay to look at, but they're limited. And one of the limits of an average is that it takes into account really high, low, you know, high values, really low values, okay? That can influence that average. In terms of looking at pay data, Oftentimes, uh, compensation professionals will say, you want to look more at the median. The median is a better measure of central tendency because it isn't influenced by those high and low values. It's literally the middle value in an array of information. So median is important to look for. Different percentile ranks are important to look for. So do you know what the 25th percentile is, the median, the 75th, maybe the 10th or the 90th? What that can do is give you a sense of the, the variation within that data. So if you're looking at a position and you say, okay, sales manager, uh, okay, the 25th percentile is $25,000 a year, the median is $75,000, and the 75th percentile is $300,000. That, does that sound like a valid survey? Probably not, right? So look for those things. If somebody's handing you a sheet of paper that just said, here's the average salary for a sales manager, you might want to ask some more questions, right? Sample size. Uh, again, I think this one's probably common sense. I'll use a, a baseball analogy. So if you have a guy who's hitting 700 at the end of April, is he a 700 hitter? No, of course not, right? You still got to play out the rest of the season. All right, same thing with survey information. You want to know how many organizations participated in the survey. And more than that, you want to know how many provided information for a specific job. The observation, so the number of employers, number of incumbents, number of employees. You'll see it noted a couple different ways in a survey. So pay attention to sample size. Uh, and I love that one, especially now during political seasons, right? You know, I love, you know, you'll see the chart up there. Oh, new poll says this. And then if you look in the lower right-hand corner of that, that chart on, on CNN or on Fox, you've got, you know, this was a sampling of 300 people who were called between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock at night on a Thursday in Iowa. You know, pay attention to sample size. Population related to that. So who is being surveyed overall? Okay. Are they matching the industry that you want to compare against? The geography, the size of your organization, really important. And then how is the survey conducted? This is really, really important, and a lot of, a lot of folks overlook this. Again, especially because there's so much free information that's out there, uh, particularly online. Did individuals report the information themselves? So I'm an IT manager, and I'm going to go to this site, and I'm going to say, as an IT manager, I'm on Glassdoor, Salary.com, whatever it is, I make $75,000 a year. Or are actual employers, particularly employers with people who are trained in human resources and how to actually complete these surveys and conduct these surveys, are they the ones that are completing it? You have some inherent dangers with self-reported data, okay, because people may not be matching those positions correctly, which I'll talk about in a moment. Another danger is if you are in the practice of calling up the people in your industrial parkway and asking them what they're paying their machinists and their assemblers, uh, please don't do that. <laughs> Uh, the FTC doesn't like that. Um, that's considered collusion. That could be considered wage fixing. A lot of bad words there. You want to avoid that. Matter of fact, that's why organizations like ERC, one of the reasons why we came into existence in the 20s. So as, as the uh, uh, United States was going through all the antitrust and, and all sorts of different uh, components of the early industrial revolution, Groups like ERC could come along and say, okay, we'll survey all of you employers. We'll report the data back confidentially so that you don't know what the people on your industrial parkway specifically are paying. And the federal government said, okay, that's okay. So please don't do that. If your HR people are doing that, you know, please discourage them from doing so. Uh, matching methods. So again, closely related to this. 
When you look at a survey, does it just have a job title? Or does it have a job title and a job description? Job descriptions are really, really, really important. Okay, I use that example of an IT manager. I will guarantee you the IT manager at your company has a significantly different role than an IT manager at PNC. Okay, but if they're both relying on the same information just based on job title to say, hey, I need this raise, that's not really reliable. Okay, and the same is true for those of you who are participating in surveys. Make sure you have a job description there so you can actually compare more apples to apples. And then how old are the data? Okay, are you looking at information that's three months old or three years old? So again, even though the you know, wages are you know, two, two and a half, three percent, that still adds up. You know, the compound impact of that adds up over time. You, you need to know how old are these data? When were the, these folks surveyed? A lot of the free sources you're gonna find, again, particularly online, you can't answer these questions. They don't provide that or it's not overt. Uh, it's difficult to find. So just be wary of that. All right, great, thanks Marty. Now what should I pay? I wanna know, what should I pay people? I'm not gonna tell you. Surprise. Uh, there's another question you need to ask. Okay, and if you haven't asked this yet, you need to do this. So what do you wanna pay? Okay, relative to your specific companies, the industries that you're in, overlying uh, economic conditions. Okay, there are questions that you should be able to answer before you even look at a survey, right? Do you want to lead the market, lag the market? Do you want to match? Okay, how do you want to pay relative to the market? What are you going to weight? Is experience important? Certifications, skills, performance. What role does performance play in your compensation philosophy, your comp systems? So we've been talking a lot about base pay, um, particularly after the recession, okay? You're seeing a lot more of total compensation uh, have more of a variable component, right? And that doesn't come out in some of this information, some of this data, and it's very difficult to measure because, again, your incentive plan, your program's gonna be a lot different than yours and yours and yours, okay? But that's something to keep in mind, too. Uh, are you gonna have ranges, grades? How do people stack up internally? You know, we hear this all the time, and I'll go back to that hiring situation. Hey, we need to hire a new CNC operator, but everybody we're talking to wants to get paid up here, and currently we pay everybody on our staff, like here. So we can't justify paying somebody up here because it'll tick everybody else off over here and then we gotta bump everybody up. So how do we, if you aren't keeping up with this information, if you're not keeping up with trends, you, a lot of times you might be in that position, right? So how does it stack up internally? And then what's the role of your total rewards? So we call it total rewards, your benefits, your paid time off. Okay, what else, you know, 401k matches, retirement plans, stock options. What's the total value of all of those things in the big picture? And how can you use that information in terms of attraction, retention of, of top talent and communicate that and use that? Uh, one more thing I wanna mention, uh, if, if you weren't already aware of this, uh, the Department of Labor, and you know, Seth, I've heard him speak on this a number of times in the last few months, uh, Department of Labor uh, issued some uh, proposed changes to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, I am not an attorney, but I definitely encourage you to talk to your attorneys, talk to your HR folks about this because it, it will impact your businesses and it will impact your compensation. Um, they are looking at, among other things, raising, raising the threshold um, by which you, you have to pay people overtime, right? So the current threshold uh, is around $455 a week. Okay, they wanna raise that proposed to around 970 a week, which means anyone making under $50,000 in your company might be entitled to overtime. Okay, might be, and I'm gonna say might be. The rules have not been finalized. There's uh, the uh, Comment period just ended, and we're looking at some of these changes taking place in 2016, so you need to be aware of that. So the bottom line with all of that is that because of the role that compensation plays in your ability to attract and retain great people, you know, this stuff is too important to get wrong. So if you're sitting here going, oh my gosh, we've never thought of these questions, we don't have anybody on our team who can do this, who has this expertise, we're just reactive, okay, people come in, they ask for a raise, or we're making the job offers, we have no idea how this is put together, I've never even heard of the FLSA. Okay, if those are some of the things going through your head, you know, I definitely encourage you to take a step back. You know, there are a lot of resources available for you. You know, certainly within Northeast Ohio, you have groups like a magnet, uh, ERC, we, as you might imagine, we work with organizations all the time. Matter of fact, our uh, compensation, head of compensation, uh, Sue Bailey, Sue, are you still here? Yeah, Sue's in the back. So Sue works with companies all the time in terms of answering those questions, putting a philosophy together before you start slotting in that data. Uh, 
Bureau of Labor Statistics, great source of free information. There's a lot of resources avail available for you. Uh, and again, I'll just emphasize, whatever you do, don't look at this information in a vacuum uh, and don't consider convenience to be relevant. Uh, do your homework, have your folks do their homework and seek out other resources. And that being said, I mentioned before, uh, these slides are gonna be available. So we have a URL set up and I'm sure the folks at Magnet are gonna get more information out to you. I'll leave this up for a moment, but you can download all these slides. You can actually download our wage and salary adjustment survey uh, for free from that site. And then we have a list of other resources there as well. And with that, I want to say thank you. I uh, appreciate your time today. And I'll turn it back over to you.